I speak to you as a fellow citizen of the United States of America, deeply concerned about the welfare of our beloved country. The message I bring is not a happy one, but it is the truth. Those who will learn nothing from history are condemned to repeat it. This we are doing in the Americas today. To bring the truth to light is our challenge, this day and every day. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I am sorry to say that all is not well in so-called prosperous, wealthy, and powerful America. We have moved a long way and are now moving further and more rapidly down the soul-destroying road of socialism. The evidence is clear, shockingly clear, for all to see. Once government steps over this clear line between the protective or negative role into the aggressive role of redistributing the wealth through taxation and providing so-called benefits for some of its citizens, it becomes a, mean for, a means for legalized plunder. The Supreme Court never ventured into the issues of redistribution of wealth uh, and sort of more basic issues of political and, and, and uh, economic justice in the society. And uh, to that extent, as radical as I think people tried to characterize the Warren Court, uh, it wasn't that radical. It, it didn't break free from the essential constraints that were placed uh, uh, by the Founding Fathers in the Constitution, at least as it's been interpreted, and Warren Court interpreted it in the same way, that, that generally the Constitution is a charter of negative liberties, says what the states can't do to you, says what the federal government can't do to you, but it doesn't say what the federal government or the state government must do on your behalf. I, I think it's a remarkable document. Uh, I think uh, which one uh, the, the original Constitution uh, as well as as well as the uh, Civil War amendments but I think it is an imperfect document and I think it is a document that reflects uh, some deep flaws uh, in uh, American culture the, the colonial culture nascent at that time uh, African Americans were not uh, first of all they weren't African Americans the <laughs> Africans at the time uh, were not considered uh, as part of the polity that was uh, of concern uh, to the framers. I think that, as Richard said, it was a nagging problem uh, in the same way that these days we might think of environmental issues or some other problem that where you have to balance, uh, you know, cost benefits um, as opposed to seeing it as a moral problem involving uh, uh, persons uh, uh, of moral worth. And, and in that sense, I think we can say that uh, uh, the Constitution reflected a enormous blind spot in this culture that carries on until this day, and and uh, and that the framers uh, had that same blind spot. The scriptures also tell about our inspired Constitution. If you accept these scriptures, you'll automatically reject the counsel of men like Senator Fulbright and others who depreciate our Constitution. If you use the scriptures as a guide. You know what the Book of Mormon has to say regarding murderous conspiracies in the last day and how we're to awake to the awful situation today. To avoid being mistaken for such a sellout, I chose my friends carefully. The more politically active black students, the foreign students, the Chicanos, the Marxist professors and structural feminists and punk rock performance poets. And then the third lesson and tip actually come from two of my favorite political philosophers, Mao Zedong and Mother Teresa, not often coupled with each other, <laughs> but, but the two people that I turn to most. We know that the free market is nonsense. We know that the whole point is to game the system, to beat the market, or at least find someone who'll pay you a lot of money because they're convinced that there is a free lunch. We know this is largely about power, that it's an adults-only, no-limit game. We kind of agree with Mao that political power comes largely from the barrel of a gun. And we get it that if you want a friend, you should get a dog. Uh, one of the things that has happened, I think, too often to progressives is that uh, we don't understand the relationship between minimum goals and maximum goals. Uh, you know, right after Rosa Parks uh, refused to give up her seat, if the civil rights leaders had jumped out and said, okay, now we want uh, reparations for slavery, we want uh, redistribution of all wealth, 
and we want to legalize mixed marriages. If that had been there, they had come out with a maximum program the very next day, uh, they'd have been laughed at. Um, instead, they came out with a very minimum program. Uh, you know, we just want to integrate these buses. Uh, the students a few years later came out with a very minimum program. We just want to sit at the lunch counter. But inside that minimum demand was a very radical kernel that eventually meant that from 1954 to 1968, you know, complete revolution was on the table uh, for this country. And I think that this green movement has to pursue those same steps and stages. Right now we're saying we want uh, to move from suicidal gray capitalism to some kind of uh, eco capitalism where, uh, you know, at least we're not, you know, fast tracking the destruction of the whole planet. Um, will that be enough? No, it won't be enough. Uh, we want to go beyond ex systems of exploitation and oppression altogether, but that's a process. And uh, so the green economy will start off as a small subset and uh, we will, we're going to push it and push it and push it um, until it becomes the engine for transforming the whole society. I have tried to warn you of the darkness that is moving over us and what we can do about it if we will only follow the prophets. Have you counted the cost? If our countrymen and especially the body of the priesthood continue to remain complacent, misled though some of our, through some of our news media, deceived by some of our officials, and perverted by some of our educators, are you prepared to see some of your loved ones murdered? your remaining liberties abridged, the church persecuted, and your eternal reward jeopardized. I have personally witnessed the heart-rending results of the loss of freedom. I have seen it with my own eyes. It may shock you to learn that the first communist cell in government, so far as we know, was organized in the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the 1930s. It may surprise you to learn that I was host to Mr. Khrushchev for a half day when he visited the United States. Not that I'm proud of it. I opposed his coming then and I still feel it was a mistake to welcome this atheistic murder as a state visitor. But according to President Eisenhower, Khrushchev had expressed a desire to learn something of American agriculture. And after seeing Russian agriculture, I can understand why. As we talked face to face, he indicated that my grandchildren would live under communism. After assuring him that I expected to do all in my power to assure that his and all other grandchildren will live under freedom, he arrogantly declared in substance, you Americans are so gullible. No, you won't accept communism outright. But we'll keep feeding you small doses of socialism until you'll finally wake up and find you already have communism. We won't have to fight you. We'll so weaken your economy until you fall like overripe fruit into our hands. And they're ahead of schedule in their devilish scheme. No American is worthy of citizenship in this great land who refuses to take an active interest in these important matters. All we hold dear as a great Christian nation is at stake. Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay? And that eating uh, shellfish is an abomination. Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. The fight to save the Constitution is not mere controversy nor the fight against communism. In fact, it is a war with the devil. It is a war with the devil, Christ versus Antichrist. And I am willing to fight it. It is a fight against the greatest evil in this world, a ruthless, powerful, godless conspiracy. Now the scriptures tell us 
about the war in heaven over free agency, similar to the war we're going through now, where the devil's program was guaranteed security as opposed to the Lord's program of letting each choose for himself, even if he, if he makes the wrong choice. Once you understand these scriptures, you'll understand why the presidents of the Church have opposed communism, socialism, and the welfare state. And you see why you must oppose them, too, if you're in harmony with the word of the Lord. To the patriots, I say this. Take the long, eternal look. Stand up for, for freedom, no matter what the cost. It can help to save your soul and maybe your country.